Wonderful. Hello, wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, nice. Hello, everyone. Hello, and uh, it's a pleasure to see you all after a long time of online events in person again. Welcome. Welcome to the EU Week, which is jointly organized by the TUM School of Management, the HEC Paris, their student association, HEC Debat, us, the TUM Speaker Series, and since this year, the Koschminski University from Warsaw. Ladies and gentlemen, dear honorary guests, fellow students, and of, and of course, everybody who is following us online. Welcome to today's event. Please, firstly, join me in welcoming our amazing guest for this afternoon, EU Commissioner Maria Gabriel. A warm round of applause. <laughs> the schedule of today is the following. First, Professor Henkel, the initiator of the EU Week, and Professor Winkelmann, TUM's Senior Vice President for International Alliances and Alumni, will take the stage and say their welcoming words. Afterwards, Commissioner Gabriel will hold a keynote on the topic of the future of Europe through the prism of education, research, innovation, and culture, followed by a moderated discussion and a Q&A session. So for the Q&A session, please think of some good questions you would like to ask later on. And of course, please post about us and tag us and follow us on social media. But for now, let's talk about Europe. Let's get inspired. Please give a warm welcome and applause for Professor Dr. Henkel. Professor Henkel, the stage is yours. Warm welcome also from my side, and uh, thank you for this excellent introduction. So you took part of my speech away, so I don't need to do that, um, but I still do it. So also from my side, warm welcome, Commissioner Gabriel, um, Senior Vice President Winkelmann, Dean Friedel, guests of honor, professors, honorary professors, ladies and gentlemen. Both here in the hall and online, there are quite a few registrations online. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this key event of this year's European Union Week. Welcome, Toplo Postrestane. Hope that was understandable. Sardetschnie Vitame, bienvenue and welcome. Let me thank the student initiative, um, I should say, as I am, TUM Speaker Series, and also Professor Clemens Jus, who made this event possible. And more broadly, also HEC Paris. Ashesi Deba and Kozminski has been great partners in bringing this together. We are celebrating an anniversary. This year is the fifth time we are holding the European Union Week. We started it in 2017, being shocked and saddened by the Brexit, by this narrow vote in the UK to leave the Union. Brexit became possible because many young people in the UK did not vote. And it is uh, somewhat cynically the young people who suffer most from this union, um, from this Brexit. So I think there's an urgent need to inform especially young people of the European Union, of its benefits, and to rekindle enthusiasm for Europe. Let me ask you, do you know that yesterday was Europe Day? Okay, I see people nodding. Not too many. Good. Uh, do you know why? That's a harder question. So yesterday I asked the same question in a lecture hall, introductory course bachelor. Hardly anyone knew. So the answer is, uh, for many of you, maybe a repetition, but maybe not. Um, on May 9th, 1950, Robert Schumann, at that time French foreign minister, published a declaration that went down in history as the Schumann Declaration. It laid the foundation for the European Union. The proposal was to pool the production of coal and steel under one authority, the production of several European countries and foremost France and Germany. And the goal behind this idea was not an economic one. It was not about more efficient production. The goal was peace. Because with that authority and uh, an oversight over coal and steel production, it would become impossible for 
any country to prepare war because then you need steel and for steel you need coal. So at its origin, the EU is a peace body. Today, Putin's war against Ukraine reminds us in a terrible way of this reality. The EU is foremost about peace, but it also improves our lives through economic benefits, through collaboration, through furthering innovation. And um, are there Erasmus students here? So I think this is also a super important thing. Um, it's exchange in Europe to just get to know other countries and people. Our distinguished speaker today, Commissioner Gabriel, is perfectly positioned to address these topics as the EU Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Ms. Winkelmann, Senior Vice President of International Alliances and Alumni, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I'm very pleased to welcome EU Commissioner of Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, Maria Gabriel, our guest of today's TUM Speaker Series. The TUM Speaker Series provides students of all disciplines and all Munich universities a first-hand insight into various topics by distinct leaders from science, business, and politics. Many thanks to the students of the TUM Business Club for organizing this event. And for today's event, the students once again succeeded in attracting a high-ranking personality. Under the leadership of Commissioner Maria Gabriel, the New Horizon Europe, Erasmus Plus, and the cultural strand of Creative Europe programs are being implemented. Her main priorities are excellence in education, research, and innovation, tackling the research and innovation divide in Europe. No one left behind and think out of the box are her mottos. Maria Gabriel was commissioner for digital economy and society and proposed the new Digital Europe program. She worked on the EU strategy on AI as well as the launch of the Euro High Performance Computing Strategy. Maria Gabriel has been ranked among the 50 most influential women in Europe in the field of cybersecurity. And she's also known for her involvement in the fight for gender equality and was awarded the prestigious Italian prize Golden Apple. In 2020, she received the annual award of the Vienna Economic Forum Partner of the Year for her contribution to the economic development. In 2021, she received the recognition award Best Global Impact for her contribution to the European Entrepreneur Ecosystem at the prestigious forum Startup Ole in Salamanca. And in 2022, she also became a recipient of the prestigious award Donne e Innovazione. The award is handed by the Italian Association Osservatorium Tutti Media for the outstanding contribution of women who broke down barriers and stereotypes. The European Union was created to promote peace, to offer freedom and to ensure justice, as well as focus on sustainable development based on balance, economic growth and price stability to combat social exclusion and to establish an economic and monetary union. In fragile times like ours, we are more than ever aware that nothing is taken to be granted and that we have to stand up for our European values. 
And in this context, the international and pan-European orientation of the Technical University Munich is more important than ever. Exchange and networking are prerequisites for top-level research and innovation. And therefore, our university promotes internationalization with numerous programs. We have 33 partner universities in Europe and 353 Erasmus partnerships. And despite the pandemic, our international contacts are as strong as ever. Top of the list is preparing students for professional, intellectual, and societal responsibility. And the youth economies together with educational institution will shape the direction of our future. Dear Commissioner Gabriel, you've worked tirelessly towards a more perfect EU and you inspire the U European project with your dedication, reminding us that the EU is a work in progress. So we are very honored to have you here as our guest speaker today. Very welcome, warm welcome. Thank you very much, Senior Vice President, Vice Dean, dear professors, dear young people, dear friends in Paris, in Munich and online. I would like, first of all, to say thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Thank you to TUM for their kind invitation. It is always a great pleasure to discuss Europe with young people. This is what Europe is, a place where we can and should discuss and shape our future together. The policy making and priority setting should reflect the aspirations of young people. So it makes sense to celebrate Europe Week this way, in dialogue, and all the more because this is not an ordinary year. 2022, is the European Year of Youth, a year dedicated to dialogue and young people, a year the purpose of which is for young people to have impact, not less significantly. It is also the 35th anniversary of the Erasmus Plus program, a program that has strived for decades to amplify young voices and multiply young learning experiences across borders. Erasmus Plus have benefited over 12 million young people so far, and we are not stopping now. Because the future of Europe is your future. This is your European week, your European year, your Europe. And as Commissioner for Education, Culture, Research, Innovation and Youth, your future, it's not your responsibility alone. It is also our responsibility to support you. And I see this future as a journey. You can go many places, but the European Union should pave good, solid roads so you can go further. First of all, this journey begins with your education. And we are working together with the member states and the education community to achieve a European education area by 2025. You know that we have the European research area now for 20 years. It's really time to build together with all of you a European education area. We want to make sure with this European education area that every young person in the EU has access to the skills they need for a rewarding job, for their participation in society, for their fulfillment in life, irrespective of their background. 
And of course, in this journey, I'm sure you want to meet companions along the way. You want to be enriched by knowledge and community of places, distant and near. And that is why, as the European Union builds this road for young people to launch into adulthood, we invest so heavily in learning mobility. And we have over 28 billion euros behind the Erasmus Plus program to do just that. It is also why we have worked with higher education institutions across Europe, with the member states and the students' organizations to further connect higher education, to help universities work together, so they can give you the best start in your adult lives. And this is at the core of our European strategy for universities. In fact, we share four strategic goals with the higher education community. First, we want to strengthen the European dimension in higher education and research. We want to make sure these institutions are beacons of the European way of life. And we want you to be empowered through these institutions to be actors of change in the green and digital transitions. And finally, we want them to empower you to drive Europe's global role. All of this will rely on effective transnational cooperation. So we'll broaden support for even more European universities alliances. We want to support a total of 60 alliances encompassing more than 500 institutions, a full 10% of all our higher education institutions. So the experience will continue to inspire the entire higher education sector in Europe. And indeed, the Eurotech European University that the Technical University of Munich is coordinating is a great example of the innovative potential of the European Universities Alliances. In Eurotech, leading European Universities of Science and Technology are joining forces to build a strong, sustainable, sovereign and resilient Europe. And you are doing this through a challenge-based approach, using a virtual campus, and in close collaboration with industry and civil society organizations. I would like really to say thank you, and I would like to congratulate you for this. At the same time, to make sure that you and other alliances can fully develop, will redouble efforts to create a voluntary legal status for alliances of higher education institutions. We want you all to have the tools to take common strategic decisions, pooling resources and services. And that's why we are planning to launch this summer a dedicated pilot open for all higher education alliances to test several models in a bottom-up way. This, topic, this approach is very close to my heart. And we are also taking steps towards making possible a joint European degree. I will be really curious to know what, are, what is your opinion on this issue. We would like again from this summer to, to test some ideas together with our alliances, because what I can say even at that stage is that not all our alliances have the same view on some of the main issues and challenges that we have to tackle, but that's our strength. We need to preserve this diversity, because diversity of universities, that means for me, diversity of students, diversity of idea, diversity of talents, and we have to preserve this in Europe. So, the final initiative that I would like to bring to your attention when we talk about European strategy for universities, it's of course the European Student Card Initiative. Our ambition is quite high, to provide this card for every student in Europe by mid-24. We are fully aware that there is a lot of challenges, but I'm convinced that it's really time to provide this facility to all our students. 
not only to have information before, during, and after a nobility experience, but really to use what we acquired during the online and distance learning with the COVID-19 and to transform this into a strength for us as Europe. Second, I think that it's good to share with you that university is the door to discovering Europe and the values of the European Union. Today, I think that we can all agree these values are as important as ever. Just look at the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Look at the impact of our values as we proudly stand with the Ukrainian people. The support we give to institutions of higher education as they show solidarity with Ukrainian students, researchers and other refugees is also a fundamental part of supporting this journey into adulthood in Europe. We saw so many higher education institutions like yours organize emergency support, welcoming Ukrainian colleagues and students. And I'm really very proud, just as I'm proud of your response, mobilizing every instrument to support you. And that's why just a few weeks ago, I proposed that 200 million euros could be front-loaded from Erasmus Plus program to support those fleeing the war, especially students. I also announced a new Maris Klodowska Curie action called MSCA for Ukraine, which will offer fellowship in the European Union and Horizon Associated countries to researchers who had to flee Ukraine. And finally, we launched a new platform, European Research Area for Ukraine, to support the Ukrainian research community with information on jobs, on housing, or any additional information that they need. And all these efforts are not only for science and knowledge, they are reaffirmation of our values, of who we are as a community. And they empower our young people to take these actions forward and build on them into the future. Third, journeys often acquire the character of a mission. As we travel, we discover that we are merely walking down a road, but going somewhere. And I see it as our job to make sure all these roads we are building have the proper signs so that young people can find where they want to go. For example, so many young people have realized they want to dedicate themselves to fighting climate change. So to boost entrepreneurial skills and to empower the learners to act on personal and on community level, we published a proposal for a council recommendation on learning for environmental sustainability. That's our goal, to support national authorities, schools, higher education institutions, and non-governmental organizations in better equipping learners with understanding and skills on sustainability, climate change, and the environment. Furthermore, as researchers through the Horizon Europe program, you can find solutions to the climate change challenge. And as innovators, you will find ways to bring these solutions to those who need them through instruments like the European Innovation Council or the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. So what I would like to say is that these initiatives are here for you, to support you as you become entrepreneurs or change makers and make no mistake, these solutions will save lives in Europe and beyond. And this is why the New Horizon Europe supports our missions. For instance, I was glad to announce last week the first 100 cities selected to participate in the European mission for climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. 
This mission will help people at the local level transform the environment where they live, be it through mobility, through energy solutions, or through the built environment with European funding. And in total, Horizon Euro program will invest around 360 million euro in research and innovation activities linked to this mission. What is this if not empowering citizens to go on a journey that supports their community and the planet? And on top of that, these cities will act as experimentation and innovation hubs, helping more cities follow in their footsteps. And Munich and Paris are both included in these first 100 cities. So, of course, I'm always counting on universities, on young people to help us to co-create solutions and to transform these missions, that's one of the novelties in Horizon Euro program, into something operational and something tangible. I'm always saying it's true that some others already have had their mission on the moon. Our mission is on Earth, and we need to do it together with every one of you. Here, another example that I would like to share with you is the new European Bauhaus. For sure, we'll have some additional questions in the discussion, but it's the example of another one, European-wide, locally rooted initiative that is already transforming our living spaces and daily lives. This initiative is about building a sustainable and inclusive future together. It encourages a dialogue across cultures, disciplines and age groups on how to make the European Green Deal a tangible and positive experience for all. And very soon, from 9th to 12th of June, we'll organize the first ever European, New European Bauhaus Festival, which we held not only in Brussels, mainly in Brussels, but with side events across the EU and beyond. So I very much hope that you can join us and you can share with us your ideas and your suggestions, because that will be really up to us to transform this initiative into something that is not only the soul of the European Green Deal, but that will encourage much more young people to be involved. And finally, a key part of my efforts is dedicated to innovation. To support every innovator and entrepreneur, we are putting forward a new innovation agenda in early July. The latest European strategy on innovation dates back to 2011. We are not living anymore on the same planet. However, we need, we need a new innovation agenda that addresses the new generation of innovators. You can see the, the difference with the approach. In 2022, we need to pay special attention to startups as their role in innovation is prominent. And from 2024 onwards, we even expect that the main drivers of innovation will be deep tech startups. This new wave will bring together digital and physical, software and hardware. While digital startups have made our lives easier, from online shopping and banking to video conferencing, the new wave of innovation will address issues such as climate, energy, transport, transport, construction, food, agriculture or mobility. And I do believe that Europe, including the Technical University of Munich, has a competitive advantage and can lead this new wave of innovation. We can achieve this through research excellence, close collaboration with industry, and strong engineering talent pool. This is exactly what the European Innovation Agenda will strive for. And it will help us preserve talent in Europe. Your talent, 
young people's talent from within Europe and beyond. It will support young entrepreneurs and will specifically pay attention to gender balance. We'll touch this issue, I hope, very much too in the discussion. But for me, it's a topic very, very close to my heart. Because we are talking about an unlocked potential that Europe should start to use massively. So you can see, when I talk about the European Innovation Agenda, please see that always in synergy with the European strategy for universities. Because here, when we talk about innovation, of course, we, and gender balance, we need to talk about STEM education. We need to talk about entrepreneurship. Maybe here, two things to share with you. You know that we have a European Prize for Women Innovators. And every year, we are giving three prizes of 100,000 euros. This year, to mark the European Year of Youth, together with my team, we decided to award three prizes of 50,000 euros each to promising rising innovators under the age of 35. The deadline for the application is 18th of August. You have time, girls, I'm looking at you in the room. We count on you. There, very often, that's the biggest obstacle. Be confident and try, be bold. The other thing that I would like to share with you on this issue is the necessity to give much more visibility to successful girls and women. And that's why, together with my team, we started a new campaign, She You Leads. Every week, we are giving visibility to one successful girl and, or woman in Europe. And for me, the question is not only to have these kind of events and initiatives in the occasion of 8th of March, because we, we always listen very beautiful declarations that day. The question is to have 8th of March every single day of the year. So, I think that I will stop here. Dear friends, this is one final aspect of any journey that is fundamental. And there is one aspect, and we can talk about the path we take, about the roads in front of us, the signs that orient us, or the infrastructure to support the travel. But the most important part of a journey are our protagonists. It's people, it's young people, it's every one of you. So, enough of me talking. This is a dialogue. I want to hear your views too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, Here. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for thank you very much for your insights and you've you've touched up on so many topics. Um, you said that 2022 is the European Year of Youth, shifting the policy focus towards young people um, who are the future of Europe. We are here in front of a very young audience of students. And before I ask you the first questions, we've talked about it, but I want to quickly ask the audience, who of you has done Erasmus? Please quickly show your arm. It's, it's quite a few. Well, we just heard the good news. The funding is being increased, and more of us will be able in the future to do Erasmus and to, to have those experiences. But Ms. Gabriel, you've been a strong advocate of this program. Why, can you rephrase again, why is it so important for you that the funding is increasing? 
Well, thank you very much for this question. First, when we talk about a budget for a program, Erasmus Plus or Horizon, I want really to share with you, that's not an amount of money. For me, this budget, that means much more people participating in this program and much more opportunities for people that, that didn't have this opportunity until now. As I said, it's since the beginning of the program, it's 12 more than 12 million people that participated. Now our objective with this budget is in only seven years from 21 to 27 to, to, to have 12 million more. So you can see we are changing the pace and we are changing the dimension. That's the first thing. The second, I would like uh, really to, to, to share with you, when you, you ask European citizens, what are the, the European success stories? Do you know? that Erasmus Plus is one of, the first, one of the first three priorities and success stories that our citizens are thinking spontaneously, together with peace and the, 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 the free circulation of persons and, and services. So Erasmus Plus, it's a symbol. It's not just a program. It's about learning uh, experience. When we see people that participated in Erasmus Plus, they can find more easily jobs. They are fully aware that they develop soft skills. They create friendships that are here for entire life. So with this new budget, what we would like to do is to have a more inclusive, more digital and more green program. First, for sure, this program should be much more inclusive. That's why this time we are not focusing only on higher education institution, but we are covering the entire, uh, the, the, the entire lifelong learning approach from early childhood to one of the novelties. There is a dedicated scheme for schools and we are going to, 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 adult, to adult learning. And there is a special focus on vocational education and training. For sure, the, the other novelty is to have a green Erasmus. I think that our young people are very clear on climate change. We have ideas and we would like to participate for the implementation of these ideas. So that's why we are encouraging now our young people to participate and to implement their, their solutions. And, of course, the more digital, because we learned uh, some lessons with the COVID-19. So that's why now there will be a new format of mobility, the blended mobility. That's a combination between virtual and physical format. I would like immediately to reassure you, never new technologies and virtual format will replace the real one, the emotional, the people-to-people -people contact. But that allow, allows us to avoid some, some blockage and some situations that we already faced. Final point, I think that with Erasmus Plus program, our young people ask to be much more involved in democracy, in this promotion of values. That's why now we have a new scheme. We are, we are uh, supporting young people that they would like to participate in this project at local first time, local, regional and national level to promote democracy and to build really together with us uh, a stronger and resilient society. 30 million euro is the funding, and with this funding only for this year, we'll, we'll support more than 500 projects. So don't hesitate to be aware and to have much more information on, on these novelties, because that's, that means for me additional chances for our young people. When talking about Erasmus, um, it's also about the universities, and you've touched upon the EU, which is pursuing the European strategy for universities. What, why is it so important, and what would it mean for us as students individually, this new strategy? Well, individually, that means that as students in European University, you are part of our driving force for change, for tackling challenges, for affirming our European uh, leadership, and at the same time for reaffirming our values. So yes, with the European strategy for universities, we would like to, 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 to provide the necessary support for our universities to build on their experience and to, 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 to provide the skills and the competencies that our students need in order really after to have people that are prepared for the different challenges of, 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 of their life. 
So I'm really very glad, first, because this strategy is a result of a common work. Don't believe that it's up to the European Commission and to come and to see this is the approach. No, our universities uh, have to preserve their autonomy, the independence, the diversity. But after a year of consultation process, we decided together really to to, to insist on these four priorities, the European dimension, I think that we all agree that there is a need to facilitate the life of our universities, to connect each other, to build alliances, and even when we talk about alliances, always have, uh, have in mind the number, we have 41 alliances with 284 universities, but we have 5,000 universities in Europe. So we need to bring everyone on board and we need to work together. Of course, uh, we need to, 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 to talk about the importance of research and innovation too. As I said, it, it's first time in a European strategy, research and innovation is integrated and is part of these, of, of these initiatives that will, that will follow. That's why when, when we talk about innovation, it's so important now taking this from the strategy to implement the initiative of incubators at universities, innovators at school or European talent, talent fair. We need now to, 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 to implement these proposals. That's something very good. And finally, when, when we talk about universities, I think that in Europe we should be proud because with our universities we have knowledge, we have excellence. And that's a great opportunity if you'd like to tackle the challenges linked to the digital and green transitions, because exactly we have the values that universities are trans transmitting to us, we are able to do it. And if we streamline and we have this European uh, strategy for universities, you're also talking about creating a pan-European innovation ecosystem. First of all, why are ecosystems so important and how would such a pan-European innovation ecosystem look like? Well, first, I think that together we need to be much more aware that the nature and sources of innovation are changing. Mm -hmm. Before, that was research results, big companies. Today, we have students, entrepreneurs, universities, citizens. At the same time, with this new wave of innovation that I already talked about, I think that it's really time for us to adapt our framework and to facilitate the work of this next generation of innovators. Ecosystems are important because that's the strength of Europe. We have an extraordinary pockets of talents. We have an extraordinary, vibrant local innovation ecosystem. But in a local innovation ecosystem, it's easier to find investors and attract talent from another continent than in other region or member state in Europe. So it's really time to connect those local innovation ecosystems. And that's why in the innovation agenda, one of the main flagship initiatives will be dedicated to that. And the other key point, local innovation ecosystem, that's our strength because exactly when we look at every single local innovation ecosystem in Europe, there is an excellent university like TUM. That's our strength and we need to preserve this. But in you, so talking about strength, you believe that us, we should focus more on, on our existing strength rather than trying to copy other uh, tech companies, for example. Where do you see the European strength? Which key technologies should we be aware of in the future? Where, where is Europe's strength since, you, as you said, that we some technologies were used by other continents? Well. It's, it's my, real, my, my personal view that we should uh, stop to lose time by making copies because I'm sure that between an original and a copy, people will always choose the original. But that means that as Europe, we need to identify those strategic areas in which we can affirm this leadership. We have already, already some, some of those strategic areas. And that will be now the, the question of how 
we can support all those that are working in this field. The fragmentation on European level, it's quite persistent, but at the same time to ensure the necessary investment in order to advance much more rapidly. When we talk about strategic areas, for sure we all have seen with COVID-19 that health it's one of those strategic, strategic areas. For sure, when we, we think about the context and the Russian aggression in war, energy is another important sector. And when we talk about energy, 42% of the startups that are the most advanced in energy efficiency and all these topics related to climate change and energy are Europeans. If we don't support them the next five years, they will look around and they will not stay in Europe. That's why I'm talking about these concrete areas. Chips Act, another, 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 another topic. Green technologies, we are very well positioned, very, very well. And I know that Munich is particularly excelling in energy and green technologies. So for sure, we have now those three main topics, health, green and digital, but we need to be as concrete as possible. And that's why we have the European Innovation Council in order to see who are the most promising companies, how they can scale rapidly, and how we can have our, our European champions. We have some of them, just to, to tell you that in 21, for the first time, Europe doubled the number of unicorns from 44 to 89, never before. When I started to talk about the innovation agenda, well, a lot of smiles in front of me. Well, can, can you look at a little bit of our results? No. In 21, we have excellent results on a number of our unicorns, on our early stage startups. For the first time, Europe received as much investment as the in United States for early stage startups, so 5 million euros. But for sure, and for the first time, we tripled the investment in innovation in Europe, 100 billion. So now it's time, really, in these strategic areas with deep tech, to invest massively, to connect the innovation with education and research, always to think about the role of religion and the strengthen of the local innovation ecosystems. And that's what we, we try to do at European level. You, you've just referred to certain investment flows and that we are on the same level with the US. This has always has been a key issue also when we debate in Munich about startups and VCs and it's often about venture capital. And also in your mission letter from Ms. von der Leyen, one key aspect is to ensure sufficient investment flows to disruptive research and breakthrough innovations. So could you specify where do we stand and where do we need to go? Well, what I can say that two years after the start of the mandate, for the first time, we have such amount of money dedicated to research and innovation in Europe and education. Because for me, again, I insist always when we talk about research, we have to talk education, innovation, and for all the elements. First, we have Horizon Europe program, 95.5 billion euros. That's the biggest in the world public uh, program for the investment in research and innovation. And for the first time within Horizon Euro program, you have an entirely dedicated pillar on innovation with the European Innovation Council, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, and the ecosystem program. I insist on the European Innovation Council because, believe me, that was not easy to take this decision to invest in startups and companies. Never before at European level we, we done that always in projects, in, in cooperation activities. But yes, we have to take some risk. Yes, we'll fail for sure in some cases, but we need to change the mindset in Europe. When you fail, that's an experience, like in the United States. And not like in Europe, when you fail, that's a fatality. And that's why we insist on, on, on that. The second important element when we talk about investment in research and innovation is for, for sure the resilience and recovery facility plans. For the first time, our member states decided to invest so much in research, innovation, and education. Only in education, there is 80 billion euros. Never before we decided to invest so much in education at European level. And for research and innovation, there is more than 55 billion. So you can see, we have to seize the momentum. An unprecedented amount of money 
really decided to be invested in research, innovation, and education. For me, the challenge is how to fulfill with adequate content the framework for these investments. That's now the right time to choose strategic areas, to stay focused on things that maybe in the first view are not seeming to be very big, but that will make a real difference on the ground in the real life of people. That's for me now the, the, the main task the next few, few months with my team. You've touched upon that currently a lot of money is, well, money is through the COVID pandemic uh, there, but now we have the new more serious topic of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. How is the EU, and especially on the research and innovation side, helping Ukraine and including Ukraine in, 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 in your department? I'm, I, as I already said, it, I'm really proud, proud of my community of higher education institutions, innovators, edu educators, because since the very beginning, we were extremely mobilized. First, of course, that was thanks to the Erasmus Plus program, a maximum flexibility, ongoing projects can immediately reallocate money in order to, to welcome Ukrainian uh, refugees, students or, or teachers. We immediately uh, created, together with our member states, a solidarity group with Ukraine. So you can see lessons learned from COVID-19, coordination. This solidarity, co uh, solidarity uh, group is here in order to see what are the best practices, what are the needs, where we need to, 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 to transfer much more, much more efforts. And that's very good because not all our member states are tackling the same, the same situation. The third element, for sure, when we talk about Ukrainian uh, students and teachers and researchers, they need to have access to, to pedagogical materials in their own languages. So that's why we mobilize the school education gateway, gateway, that is a platform where they can have access to their own Ukrainian platform, and that was immediately coordinated. Of course, we mobilized our e-training community. That's the biggest platform in Europe for uh, schools and, 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 um, research and um, educators. And here we have more than 3,000 3, Ukrainian teachers that are participating. When we talk about research, first, you, we all have seen extraordinary mobilization. We created the European Research Area for Ukraine platform where they can find all the necessary information. Of course, here uh, we have now this Marie Sklodowska Curie Action uh, Fellowship Scheme. We'll cover around 200 Ukrainian researchers. There will be no the normal selection procedure. We fully understand in which situation they are. We need to, to welcome them. Of course, we need to stay mobilized. That's why you know that in Horizon Europe program and Erasmus Plus, we decided to waive the contribution of the country for 21 and 22, so they can participate as associated country, even they are not associated country. So for them, that was a very, very strong signal. And finally, I think that we need to, uh, to anticipate a little bit more because that's an emergency now. We are present, we, we mobilized a lot, but we need to think about the reconstruction. And here we need to identify together with them what are the most pressing needs. Above all, I think that the most important it was that when we talk about values, together with the education, research, innovation community and culture, I must say, they were extremely mobilized too. We know what we are talking about. And that's something that is not only beautiful words, it's above all actions. And that's a very, very strong signal. Thank you for, for those insights. We are now very soon coming to the Q&A session. One more question I would like to ask you, a topic that is also very important to you, and you have many initiatives you started. It's women in STEM and women empowerment. And you once said you want the European continent to be leading in startups that are led by women. How far are we? And could you elaborate on a few initiatives that you have started in this area? Well, my ambition is to double the number of women-led startups in Europe. Do you know 
that there is only 6% of startups that are entirely with, uh, on, uh, with, with women in the team. There is only 16% of women-led startups in Europe. Do you know, and that's, that's for me really, really something not acceptable, that when we talk about venture capital, in 2020, venture capital for women-led companies, that was 2% from all the other venture capital invested in men-led companies. In 21, do you believe that we have a decrease 1%. So it's just not acceptable. As I said, it we have we have to support our women and girls. That's why, for me, again, that's a chance that the commissioner is responsible and for education and for innovation. First, when we talk about education, we would like much more to support our girls to see in STEM education and in those topics a perspective for them. That's why a very concrete initiative with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, Girls Go Circular. We are offering training to all these li topics linked to the circular economy to 40,000 girls. I'm fighting now with my team to have much more and to have all our member states uh, on board. But that's a very concrete example. I'm fully aware that that will be not enough. That's why in the new innovation agenda, I would like to propose to have a new initiative on deep tech talent. And here we'll not talk about 40,000. I would like to talk about 1 million talents. And for sure, half of those have to be women. That's not everything. We need to talk about innovation. And I'm very glad that together with the European Innovation Council, we decided to change things. I will always remember in March 2020, I asked the European Innovation Council how many women-led companies are funded by, by the EIC. And they told me 8%. No way. There is no only 8% of talented women in Europe. So what I decided, and I asked my team just to provide me the opportunity to see if it will work, is to have at least 25% of women accessing to interviews. Excellence will be always at the heart of our decisions, always. But only with this sim simple measure, do you know in five months how this number changed? We passed from 8 to 29% of women-led companies funded by AC. Now the next step for this year is at least to have 40%. So together with, with my team, again, I would like to say we insist on these simple, simple sometimes measures that will make a difference. A final point, when we talk about doubling the number of startups, there is a new initiative that I launched, Women Tech EU. Our intention is, initially, it was to support 50 women-led led deep tech startups. We worked a lot, and this year, for only for 22, we increased the budget five times, and that means that this year we'll support 130 deep tech women-led companies. And my intention, for sure, it's not to stop here, is to have the same initiative in 23 and 24. So I fully believe that from these 500, 3 or 400, they will be European champions. But we need to prov provide them the, the same the same chances. So. I will stop here. I think that you can feel my, my passion about this, this project. But there is no miracle solution. We need role models, provide more visibility. I mentioned the campaign and the prices. More girls in STEM fighting stereotypes and concrete initiatives to attract, to attract them. Working closely with our universities uh, and, of course, much more initiatives to support especially in, in the first stages where it's really risky to take and to, to have this, this part and to make a career. It's so nice to hear that the European Union and Commission is moving and that there are some concrete examples of, of success of those stories. If you have a question, we, will, we have two runners with microphones. If you just raise your arm, if you have one, and then we will collect them. Um, and you can ask them. But I will also have questions from Slido, so either if you're comfortable talking, otherwise 
We have plenty of questions online already. Could you really quickly, maybe the first online question is, what is the Commission's strategy on tackling the increasing competition between the US, Europe and China in cutting edge research, innovation and education? Well, I already <laughs> answered somehow to this, to this question. Uh, first, it's really to identify our strengths and after now to have a new innovation agenda and to stay focused on these strategic assets. We started, for me, the starting point, the catalyst is the European Innovation Council. We already have seen that this pilot project, it's not anymore a pilot project. We need to have this uh, for, for, for not only for the entire period, but with much more initiatives like, like this one. So for me, that's now the, the, main, the main question with the innovation agenda, to be able to propose concrete solutions to the main challenges for, for our European champions to compete with China and United States. Access to, fin to, to access to finance, regulatory burden, fragmentation of internal market. It's really very, very hard. Access to talent, that will be the most fierce competition. Let's be very, very honest. That's the most important. And that's why we need on only, I, I don't like the, this, this expression to keep our talents. I'm a young person. No one can keep me. I can choose to stay and to, to develop my ideas but to be attractive destination too. So that's why uh, that will be one of the, the concrete examples in the innovation idea. It's time to have a startup visa in Europe. <laughs> it's really, that's something simple that, that can work. And of course, we need to address the local ecosystems and the connectedness between, between them. Otherwise, it will absolutely continue to be impossible to compete if we don't provide at least five tools, five initiatives that will facilitate the, the, the work, the life of our innovators, and they will become much more able to compete with China, China or America. I believe we have one question over here. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Gabriel, for your words. As you have mentioned, we are currently under attack. Our values are under attack to an extent that they're probably never been in the lifetime of anyone here in the room. And we're trying to meet this attack currently with a six package of sanctions. But that is endangered because there's one prime minister, Mr. Orban, who is currently opposed to an oil embargo, which is a problem because we are still dedicated to this principle of anonymous voting. So Vladimir Putin is under the impression that we are weak and because we believe in democracy and we believe in discussion. And if we don't want to prove him right, why is it so difficult for us to overcome this principle that every single government needs to be fine with every single decision, at least in areas that are so decisive as this question that we're currently facing? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that I understood well the question because first, uh, I think that always uh, we, we, are, uh, we are able to find a compromise, but it's really, it's really time sometime to be bold and to be ambitious and to be strong and firm in these, in these decisions. And I'm sure that in the actual situation there will be some reflections in the proposals for the Conference of the Future of Europe. Don't forget that it's not first time that we are facing this situation. That's why I remember I was a student. Well, I teach the decision-making process in the European Union, but even 20 years ago, we started to talk that it's time for some fields not to have unanimity. It's, high, it's time to have qualified majority to advance and to see how we can be strong in some situations. But you know, it's a wish. <laughs> it's our member states that have to, to tackle these, these, these challenges. From my side, I'm really proud with what we have done since the beginning of Russian aggression in Ukraine. And as Commissioner for Innovation, Education, Research, Culture and Youth, I see this as an opportunity to accelerate. If you'd like to be independent in the field of energy, if you'd like to accelerate the green transition, if you'd like to offer the best education conditions and be attractive, it's now time to do it together with all of, all of us. And that's what we, we try to promote as approach with my team. A question that has quite many upvotes from online is, we are talking about academics 
all the time. And are there any pr plans to promote the exchange of young people in the EU, EU who do not follow the academic path so that no one is left behind on the way? To come in the well, EU. that's exactly what I said with the new Erasmus Plus program. It's not only about exchange between academics, we are talking about real youth exchanges. With the new Erasmus Plus program, there is a possibility for an individual uh, exchange or even when we talk about schools for an cl entire class to go. That's something completely, completely new. And that's why dear young people use the opportunity of the European Year of Youth to tell us on a very concrete way what do you like to see as for the initiative. First, the place to be is the European Youth Portal. You can see what are the different more than 2,000 activities. And you can even label your own activities as activities of the European Year of Youth. After, there is concrete examples of initiative, our young people told us very clearly. We have three main priorities, education and training, climate change, mental health. But of course, digital, of course, culture. So for me, what is the question of 2022? It's to have proposals coming from young, young people, like this one at European level, that will be done after 21st of December 22. The challenge for me is together with every one of you, our young people in Europe, to transform the European year of youth into an year that was the base for a legacy, for an impact. And that's now the, the challenge uh, ahead of us the next six months because we already start the fifth month of the initiative. Fascinating. I think one more very quick question, or a second one of you have a short one but so then we can then wrap it up. Hi, um, thank you so much. It was really encouraging to hear your vision for the future. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the European educational area that you're working towards building. In particular, one reason that I and some of my like fellow students have experienced that one really big reason to go to the US or to look for other places is that a lot of our degrees here are not interdisciplinary. They're very restrictive, they have many formal requirements, and it's really difficult to build the kind of degree you want to have. And I was wondering, is this something that your uh, group is focusing on improving? Maybe by allowing degrees that are combined between different EU universities that are more flexible and not tied towards kind of one siloed subject, as many currently are. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question and thank you for raising the importance of this necessity now uh, to, to, to have much more flexibility. Yes, that's one of the objectives of the European education area, of course, always in respect with, with our competencies, but that's what we would like to, like to see, what we can propose in order really to tackle some of the obstacles that are here for, for many years. That's why I bring to your attention the importance of the European Universities Alliances. For me, the European Universities Alliances are the European Universities of the future, and that's why I'm asking so much from them. They are test beds to see how we can provide solutions for these, these kind of situations. If we offer flexibility, what are the criteria? Well, if we offer these criteria, these criteria are well accepted for all the members of the Alliance, how they can build good cooperation with the others that are outside of the Alliance. So all these questions we, we, we would like to, to tackle with the European Universities Alliances, of course, not every one of them. That's why I appreciate that they are very diverse and they are working on concrete issues. And yes, that's a, in a very concrete way how we would like to tackle this. The second element is that we have our international part of the Erasmus Plus program. And definitely the European Year of Youth and the European Education Area will be an occasion for us to look again at what works well and where there is a need of improvement. And we just started there. That's only one year after the start of the program. For me, this question, I will take note because I, I definitely would like to, to receive some additional information in order to see what we can really do, respective in, again, in respect of, of our competencies. I'm sure that with the Erasmus Plus program and the European Universities Alliances, we can provide more solutions. 
but it's really time to start to test them and to see what works and what doesn't work in order to identify what is scalable at European level and what is exportable outside of the European Union. It's, it's again time for action. This leads us to the concluding part of today's session. Thank you very much for being us with us. And one last question would be just simply, what, what advice would you have for the young audience here sitting with us? And what excites you about the future of Europe ahead of us? Well, it's always really frustrating, this question, what is your advice? That's my question. What is your advice? How we can improve things? How we can do things differently? Because, of course, my advice is, as for always, every young people, be bold, be ambitious, be creative, think out of the box, and really don't hesitate to be provocative and to, and to, to invent things. So that's, that's what, uh, what, what I appreciate. A, a lot, and that's for me the most important thing. After, when we talk about the future of Europe, I think that, that I'm a very lucky commissioner because I have a portfolio that is touching the daily lives of our citizens. At the same time, as Europe, we have something unique when we talk about education, research, innovation, young people, culture. What I would like to see, and that will not be very pleasant for some, some of our member states. What I would like to see is more often for the future of Europe is to join words and actions. Not only to have beautiful declarations and recommendations and conferences, but to act more rapidly, concretely, with young people, and at the same time with a future-oriented vision rooted in our values, in our experience, and again, in our extraordinary, unique richness as Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, yeah, we would quickly like to take a okay. team picture now. We okay. would like to thank very much everyone who helped us having this event, the TUM SOM. Thank you very much, but also the TUM Speaker Series, our previous presidents who helped us get back after COVID. <laughs> and thank you all for being here tonight. And thank, thank you. you.